Hi folks, today we're going to talk about ATP and how it is hydrolyzed, that is how water is able to cleave off a phosphate group from the tail of ATP. Uh, we're going to talk about that in uh, free solution and we're also going to talk about it in the context of different enzymes such as ATPases and kinases. And we're going to compare and contrast a little bit how uh, enzymes are able to make this more efficient process and able to harness ATP to the best of its ability. All right, folks, so we're going to start out talking about ATP hydrolysis in free solution, uh, which means that largely hydrolysis occurs just by free waters. Uh, the ATP over here as it's drawn, you can see uh, adenosine uh, triphosphate, adenine nitrogenous base attached to a ribose, and then we have three phosphates. These are termed the alpha, the beta, uh, and the gamma phosphates uh, with reference to how close they are to the sugar ring. Uh, those are all in free solution, and this is actually an example of a compound that's called metastable, uh, where cleaving off these phosphates should be thermodynamically favorable, and it is very thermodynamically favorable. The delta G naught um, prime of this is around uh, 31 kilojoules per mole favorable. Very thermodynamically favorable, but the idea here is that it's actually not going to be burning in free solution very spontaneously because the kinetic energy barrier between the products and the reactants, the ATP, and then the ADP plus PI, which are our products, phosphate, the gap there is negative 31 kilojoules per mole, but the barrier, the delta G naught double dagger for the transition state, um, is too high for us to really pass on a in a real meaningful way. Uh, and so that is going to mean this thing is what's called metastable. Uh, thermodynamically favorable, kinetically disfavored. Okay, so ATP actually you can keep it in solution pretty at room temperature pretty uh, easily and, and still have most of what you started with even after a significant amount of time. And so the idea here is that this is not going to ha the burning of ATP which is should be very favorable does not happen very much just because the barrier is too high. The odds of this actually happening are really low. Um, as we know uh, we are talking about hydrolysis which uh, if you break down means water lysis or water breaking and so really all of these are going to come down to uh, a water being used to cleave up this tail. Uh, we have multiple targets we can shoot for here. Of course, there's three phosphates we can go for. Usually what happens um, is that the gamma phosphate is cleaved um, to form an ADP, though you could also cleave at the beta or at the alpha in free solution. It really, all of them are pretty much equally likely. Um, you can actually see it might be a little harder for us to cleave at this uh, gamma phosphate because it has two negative charges at a neutral pH. Uh, regardless, the first step of this is pretty much always the same. Something, some sort of a base, in this case uh, free solution water, is going to deprotonate another water. And this happens spontaneously in all waters, right? You recall that uh, when we have any kind of water, we're going to have a spontaneous concentration of OH and a spontaneous concentration of H3O+, plus, um, and that equals the KW of water, right? So there's 10 to the negative 7th, usually uh, a pH 7 and 10 to the negative seventh of H3O plus. So this is, this is a relatively spontaneous process. Uh, water is a relatively weak base, weak acid, so we're not gonna see a lot of OH and H3O plus, but we do see some and significant amounts of molecules that are in that state. So our first step is always gonna be to deprotonate a water. So here we have an OH minus a hydroxyl ion, and then we have a hydronium ion. Um, the business end of this is gonna be from this nucleophilic hydroxyl. nucleophile. That means we're going to be attacking an electrophile. Uh, really the only electrophilic places, the places that are electron poor in this molecule, are at the phosphorus centers. You can imagine that uh, due to the electronegativity of all the oxygens, uh, they're pulling electron density off pretty strongly off that phosphorus, leaving it electron poor and leaving a great target for any nucleophile. Um, again we have choices. Uh, we can attack at the electrophile, at the gamma phosphate, 
or we could attack at the beta, or we could attack at the alpha. We're going to pick one. I'm just going to go for the gamma phosphate, because that's the one that we are going to see for kinases and for ATPases uh, being used. Uh, you can imagine that when you own the cleaving off one, it's easier to recharge an ATP. You don't have to try to stick on two different phosphates. It's easier just to cleave off that one. Though there are say, systems where uh, the, the pyrophosphate here, the last two are actually cleaved, and then you get an extra burst of energy if you need something that's a super you know, energetic heavy lift, uh, biochemically speaking. So we're gonna use this nucleophile to attack at the gamma phosphate. Uh, of course, when we do that, phosphorus, uh, while it doesn't have to obey the octet rule, uh, it has d electrons available to it, it does have a limit of five pairs of electrons, around a 10 electron uh, limit. And so we are going to have to break open this P double bond O and make a single bond O out of it. Just like uh, attacking a carbonyl, you would attack the carbonyl and make a, a, C double, a C single bond O with a negative charge on it. So we're going to first attack and then we're gonna break the P double bond O bond. So you can see what's happened here. We've now attached our OH, that's our old OH, to the P of the gamma phosphate, and we've also uh, generated a negative charge here on our, um, our gamma phosphate. So we have still five bonds here. We are developing a lot of negative charge. If you notice, if you go back to this one, we already had two negative charges out here on this phosphorus, and we're trying to attack with another negative charge. So we're going to experience quite a bit of repulsion trying to get in here and attack, and that's going to mean that our energy barrier, just for this step, is going to be very high. So our delta G naught double dagger is going to be high and unfavorable. But once we get there, Again, we have a lot of negative charge, and all that negative charge is going to cause some energetic penalties, and we want to get rid of it. We also would like to get our P-double bond O's back. Those are uh, unique kind of bonds, just like a carbonyl, where we would have uh, special energetics that we want to regain um, from good orbital overlaps. And so here, we're going to try to get that back. So we're going to break one of those electron pairs back down to form the P-double bond O. Um, but again, if we do this, we're going to break our five bond rule on phosphorus. We're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six bonds. So we need to kick off a leaving group. We could kick off this OH, but then we're just going to go back a step. We're just going to go back to having a free OH minus like we had before. Or what we could do would be to kick off the ADP as a leaving group. Like this. Yeah. Like this. One more try, like this. Oh my god. Okay, we're kicking off that leaving group. The ADP over here is going to be on its own, and then we're going to have a free phosphate kind of floating out here. So here's kind of what it looks like. We have an ADP. We have our inorganic phosphate. Uh, note that this still has two charges. The third pKa is a little higher. Um, and so we should have diprotonated um, or di-deprotonated um, on our inorganic phosphate. We're going to have ADP, and we're also going to be generating some of this acid, uh, just a free hydronium. So burning ATP is, uh, is not as particularly a favorable process, but we can do it, uh, and it happens relatively uh, infrequently due to the metastability of this compound. All right, so now let's talk about how this is different in an enzyme. So uh, we're going to talk about kinases, uh, and we're going to talk about ATPases. The first one we're going to talk about is an ATPase, uh, and an ATPase, as you guys are familiar, uh, is an enzyme that specifically uses ATP for an energy source. So uh, a good example of this would be something like uh, myosin, act not at, um, yeah, so uh, ATPase. Um, as the name implies, all it is is an enzyme that uses ATP. So, and it uses it to get free energy. 
and free energy is the energy that's used to do processes. So, uh, for example, in myosin, this allows it to take different conformations. It also allows it to uh, apply force. So when your muscles contract, ATP from all the different molecules of myosin is being used as a way of generating a pulling force um, and to shorten the muscle fibers to allow you to contract your muscles. Uh, so this is an example of, of what's going on in the enzymes that are ATPases. They all have very similar, they might not all have the same exact uh, amino acids that are going on, but I've shown the kind of the backbone of the protein as a squiggly line. And you see in the active site of this an ATP, of course. That's uh, one of the key substrates of an ATPase. We also have a couple of ordered water molecules. Uh, we call them ordered waters because they're always found pretty much in that same spot. There is a special place just in the active site for those water molecules. And specifically, we see a magnesium ion. Anytime ATP is burned by an enzyme, magnesium is required for that. Uh, if you've ever set up a PCR reaction, for example, uh, the polymerase that is used to uh, lengthen DNA and make new strands of DNA, uh, you have to put magnesium into that reaction to get it to work because, of course, uh, when you're making new uh, pieces of DNA, you have to use deoxy-ATP and all these other uh, nucleotide triphosphates, deoxynucleotide triphosphates, to do this. And magnesium is the key uh, factor in this. Magnesium, as you can see, has a 2-plus charge. And it helps to stabilize some of those negative charges we saw in free solution that were generated. Uh, a positive attracts a negative, and that gives us some favorable free energy, and that helps us to lower the activation energy barrier. And so where we saw last time our free energy difference, our delta G naught prime, uh, was negative 31 kilojoules per mole. Uh, does that change with an enzyme? No. Enzymes don't do anything to change the actual um, products or reactants. They might change the intermediates, they might change the way the reaction works, but they're not going to change anything about the fundamental difference between ATP at the product at the reactant side uh, and ADP plus PI. So that doesn't change, but what they do change, remember, is they change the difference in the activation energy. So where we saw last time a delta G naught prime double dagger that was very high, an enzyme can lower that quite a lot. So the magnesium is largely responsible for that difference. It also has a little bit of, of an entropic effect of getting things in the right place and ordering those waters rather than having them randomly attack each other. They're in the right place at the right time. Um, and so entropy also plays a big difference here, putting things in the right order. So entropy and magnesium help us lower the, the free energy of the transition state. That's called a delta delta G naught double dagger. So it's a change in the free energy of the transition state. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to try to do the same kind of thing. We need to generate an OH minus. This one is going to become our OH minus. Uh, but what actually happens here is that our phosphate is going to pull off a hydrogen off of this serine. Become, this will become briefly an a, a, uh, O minus. This is going to pull off a hydrogen off of this water. Uh, and then this one is going to kind of chain react and pull hydrogens all the way through. And so what it's going to look like net is that we're going to gain a hydrogen here and we're going to lose a hydrogen from here. But we've figured out enough about this reaction over the years that we know that it doesn't actually just steal the hydrogens from here. It actually goes through this kind of a chain, uh, which is kind of interesting that it does this. But the serine is already right next door. Um, this is next door to an ordered water molecule here. This is next door to ordered water molecule here. And if you notice, this water here is already ready to do an attack on that phosphorus as soon as it's ready to go. So for example, you can see that this hydroxyl ion, which we just generated from this chain of deprotonation events, the hydrogen from the serine is now here, the hydrogen from the water here is now on serine, and the hydrogen from this nucleophilic water is now on this one. So it was a chain. Now, of course, what we can do is we're going to bring that in and attack at the gamma phosphate. Uh, because the ordering of these water molecules, we don't see reactions at the other two. Um, we also position this magnesium between the beta and gamma phosphates so that if we do attack somewhere else, it's not going to get the same energetic stabilization and it's going to slow way, way, way down. 
So this is perfectly positioned here. It's held in spot uh, in place by serines and threonines that are also part of that enzyme. So this magnesium is locked in place. It has a couple of other ordered waters to keep it stable and, and, and happy. Remember that charges love water. Uh, and so we're going to attack with our, our OH at the only place we really can at the gamma phosphate. It's right next door already. Um, and it doesn't get the same bonus as if it goes anywhere else. And so we're going to attack. And remember the rule, if we attack, we have to break a bond, make a bond, break a bond. So the first one we do is attack, and then we break that bond. Okay, so here's kind of what we're left with. We have a, a trigonal bipyramidal gamma phosphate. Now this is negative, and it's next to that positive magnesium. That's a good thing because we get this bonus energetically from getting two uh, opposite charges near each other. They attract each other, and that gives us some uh, stabilization. Um, you can also see other things that are going on in here, um, that we have a five bonds to the phosphorus. We have two negative charges. If we go back one, notice what was different last time. The first step, we actually put a proton here. We protonated this side chain on this gamma phosphate, whereas in free solution we didn't do that. We left a bunch of negative charges. The reason we do that actually is to try to get rid of some of these repulsions. We recall that we talked in free solution that it's going to be hard for this hydroxyl to get near all those negatives because they're going to repel. If first we protonate using the enzyme, we're going to get rid of some of the repulsions and that's going to help our reaction proceed. So ba we're back to just the two negatives. That's good. Uh, we do want to retry to re get rid of those repulsions, and we also want to get um, our P double bond O back. So we're going to collapse down into a double bond O again, and we're going to kick off our leaving group. In this case, our best leaving group is not an OH minus, which we could theoretically do and just go backwards, but an ADP. So just like the last time, we're going to kick off the ADP, and the phosphate are going to be cleaved. Uh, and they're going to be separated. Now you can see our, our, our inorganic phosphate is cleaved and separated. It's still coordinated in the active site to our magnesium, and that's okay. Uh, our ADP is also coordinated and still bound, but it, once it's released by the uh, enzyme, they'll both kind of float away. And you can see our ordered water molecule here and our serine. One thing that's different about this, though, is recall that we should have two O minuses on this, uh, this PI. We have two OHs here. Uh, the pKa for this is just slightly too low for a neutral solution. It's, I think, a pKa of 6.8 or so. And so a neutral pH or a body physiological pH, we're, we should lose that. The, we're going to be too basic to keep that on. And if you recall, uh, one of our products from Free Solution was to snatch off and form a... Uh, H3O plus, and that's what's going to happen here. Our other order bond molecule is going to go grab that, and then we're going to be left with a final product: our inorganic phosphate, our ADP, and our H3O plus. Once the enzyme releases those things, we're going to uh, get some new ones in there: two new water ordered waters, a new ATP. Uh, our magnesium is going to stick around because we need it. Um, but we're going to have made exactly the same products as we did in free solution, but in a much, much more efficient way. So that is how ATPases are able to harness this energy. All of the free energy that was cleaved from that bond uh, is going to help the enzyme to change conformations. It's going to help uh, do some force generation, and it's going to just make things a lot faster. And so because, recall that enzymes lower that activation energy barrier, they, they make the rate go much, much faster. So... This would be our delta G naught double dagger. For uncatalyzed, that's going to be a lot larger of a barrier than we're going to see for a delta for our transition state um, for the catalyzed. So, uh, just like a speed bump on a road, the larger the bump in the road, the slower people have to go to get down that road. If suddenly you grind that speed bump down, um, you're going to be able to go a lot faster down the road because there's not as big of bumps. And so that's what's going on here. This is with our catalysis, our enzyme catalysis. We're going to be able to go a lot, much, a lot faster, uh, and that's how ATPases are able to accelerate these rates to such enormous degrees. All right, folks, and to round out our discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about kinases. A kinase is an enzyme that transfers a 
phosphate to any uh, to a substrate. So it transfers a phosphate. to a substrate um, from ATP or you know GTP or it, it really is ATP um, or um, transfers from a from a substrate to ADP sometimes kinases can run in reverse there's times in glycolysis where we see something called a pyruvate kinase, which actually uh, runs the opposite direction is what it's named for. Um, but really, if it transfers a PF4 from a substrate uh, from an ATP, you can guarantee that it's a kinase. And sometimes it's a little tricky because it goes from a substrate to an ADP to make an ATP. And so the um, it depends on which direction it's running and how it was historically identified. But this is a kinase. This is the enzyme uh, hexokinase. Hexokinase is the first uh, enzyme in glycolysis that takes glucose and adds a ATP to generate glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. And for all of these ATPase enzymes, of which this is clearly one, uh, it just transfers the phosphate onto a substrate instead of just burning it. Uh, we need a magnesium as a cofactor. So in this case, hexokinase helps glu glucose uh, and ATP um, come together to make glucose 6-phosphate and ADP, and it uses magnesium as a cofactor. And so you can see that there's a lot of sim similarities here. We still have our magnesium coordinated in the active site. We still have our ATP uh, in the active site. And we also have an aspartic acid over here. Uh, it depends on which hexokinase we're looking at. I'm using one that uses an aspartic acid in its uh, active site. But we also have our ordered glucose, and this is just good old glucose. It's the one that is selected for glycolysis. Uh, it's the alpha form. Uh, you can see that the OH is on the opposite side from the tail. That's the way you know if it's alpha. Um, but if you were going to try to attach the glucose at the 6 position, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, carbon 6, we need to attach it up at this OH. So we need to generate uh, a a good nucleophile. So again, what we're going to do here is we're going to pull off this hydrogen. Okay, That hydrogen is going to make this o a negative, and we're going to use that negative as a nucleophile to attack the phosphorus, and then we're going to pop that charge up onto the phosphorus as oxygen. So we're going to end up with a nice um, attacking nucleophile from the glucose's 6-phosphate position. Uh, the reason that this one is chosen over all these other OHs is because, again, of proximity effects. We put the aspartate next to that OH at uh, 6 position, uh, and that's going to be the only one it can really at, uh, attack, and therefore it's going to be the one that it's going to get. So uh, the proximity of this, likewise, to the gamma phosphate is going to make it easy to do the attack, and magnesium is going to help stabilize. So we're going to have attached our glucose to our ATP for a second. You can see these are all one big long molecule now. Just for a transient minute though, as you can see, uh, we're going to be able to bring this guy back down and again kick off the leaving group. You can see the similarities. All these mechanisms do the same thing chemically. We just use different kinds of things to do it. This is uh, still burning an ATP. It's still hydrolyzing ATP, but the hydro in this case is actually an OH, a hydroxyl group uh, from a substrate instead of a water molecule. But it's the same idea. If we have a nucleophilic oxygen, we can attack uh, and cleave off the gamma phosphate. So here we've done that using a hydroxyl group on the substrate. So that's kind of cool. Here we've kicked off our ADP as a leaving group. Our aspartic acid um, has been protonated. The pKa for that is uh, 3.9. And uh, if you realize, or depending on wh where you're looking, it's 3.9. And that is going to be deprotonated at neutral pH. So a water can just come and snag that. So we're going to, again, make our same old H3O+. Okay. And once we cleave this off, our final products are going to be our glucose 6-phosphate, our, our ADP. And again, if our water comes and snags, that aspartic acid's hydrogen, we're going to make an H3O+. So you can see that 
no matter which enzyme we're using to cleave ATP, we're going to get the same set of products. That doesn't change. Our energetics aren't different because we're using different uh, enzymes. ATP is still going to become an ADP, still going to get an H3O plus out of it, and we're still going to have transferred that phosphate. Whether it's a free phosphate in solution or attaching it onto some other substrate, the same general principle applies. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope that helps, um, and we'll see you next time.